Good evening and welcome to the UCLA Political Science Department's You Heard It Here public lecture, the second one of this academic year. Tonight, we focus on the aftermath of the 2020 presidential election. I'm Darnell Hunt, Dean of the Division of Social Sciences. Thank you for joining us to hear from a few of our top political scientists as they share their knowledge and first thoughts on the election, the electorate, and our country's path forward. Our motto in the social sciences is engaging LA, changing the world. Thoughtful discussions like this aid us as we try to make sense of the dynamic changes that affect our lives. A special thanks to professors Lynn Babrick, Efren Perez, Daniel Thompson, and Aaron Hartman for taking their time to share thoughts with us tonight. It is my pleasure to introduce Michael Che, Chair and Professor of the Political Science Department. Well, thank you so much, Darnell. Um, Dean Hunt, sorry. I'm Michael Che. I'm Chair of the Political Science Department at UCLA. And I'm delighted to welcome you all to the department's second You Heard It Here event of the academic year. Thank you all for joining us tonight. And we're really um, excited to hear from our faculty panel. So You Heard It Here is a series that brings together scholars and thought leaders to explore a deep understanding of politics and contemporary issues. It's my pleasure to introduce four of our department's faculty. Lynn Vavrick is Marvin Hoffenberg's Professor of American Politics and Public Policy at UCLA and a regular contributor to The Upshot at the New York Times. She teaches and writes about elections, campaigns, and public opinion. Lynn is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and a winner of the Andrew F. Carnegie Prize in the Humanities and Social Sciences. She's the author of five books, including the book on the 2016 election, Identity Crisis, the 2016 Presidential Campaign, and the Battle for the Meaning of America. Thank you so much, um, Lynn, for joining us. Efren Perez is Professor of Political Science and Psychology at UCLA and the Director of the Race, Ethnicity, Politics and Society Experimental Lab and the Center for American and Pub Politics and Public Policy. Efren draws on psychological insights to better understand the political attitudes and behaviors of racial and ethnic groups, such as African Americans, Asian Americans and Latinos in the United States. His book, Unspoken Politics, Implicit Attitudes and Political Thinking, received two prestigious awards from the American Political Science Association in 2017. Thanks so much, Efren, for joining us. Dan Thompson is Assistant Professor of Political Science at UCLA, who studies American politics and political methodology. His research focuses primarily on electoral accountability in the United States, with a particular emphasis on the role of elections in local policymaking. He has authored and co-authored articles in leading political science journals, including a recent paper on the impact of universal vote by mail on partisan vote share, published recently in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Thanks so much, Dan, for joining us tonight. And our moderator for tonight's discussion, Erin Hartman, is Assistant Professor of Political Science and Statistics at UCLA. Her research sits at the intersection of the social sciences and statistics, and her main lines of research focus on external validity of experiments, falsification testing, and survey design and analysis. In 2012, Aaron ran the polling operation for Obama for America's analytics department, which very accurately predicted election outcomes in the campaign's battleground states. She also pre previously co-founded Blue Labs, a successful data and analytics and technology startup. Thank you so much, Aaron, for serving as moderator tonight. And um, without further ado, I'll just hand it over to Aaron. Thanks so much, Michael. Well, to our panelists, um, I figure we'll start with learning what may or may not have been surprising about this election. So the first question I have is, what is one thing we thought we knew going into the election and one thing that proved true? And what's one thing that uh, we thought we knew going into the election that turned out to not be true? And I guess we can start, uh, we'll go in the, maybe in the order that, that uh, Michael just listed. So, so Lynn, do you wanna kick us off? Sure. Okay. So just taking stock as Aaron has asked us of what we thought, you know, however many 10 days ago um, and what we know now. And so my answers would be things that we thought were going to be true that were true. Um, a lot of people were going to vote in this election and they did. And things that we thought were going to be true that ended up not being true. I would say we thought that pollsters had fixed whatever it was that generated their errors in 2016 
and maybe they did, um, but whatever um, they fixed didn't do enough to get us to the, to the accurate prediction. Yeah, so I'll jump in as well. Um, yeah, so I think I, I agree. I have the exact same thought uh, as Lynn on on the first question of what are the things that prove true. There was an incredible amount of interest in this election, uh, you know, going back more than a year. And uh, and while uh, the pandemic brought a bunch of challenges associated with voting, uh, we were able to overcome that, and we've seen incredible level of participation in this election. With you know, compared to you know another election that was very high turnout and engagement in 2008, we had 62 percent turnout, but this year we had 67 percent uh, of voting eligible population turning out to vote. Uh, it was just incredible um, degree of interest, engagement. Um, uh, that I think we're going to continue to try to puzzle over and understand better. Uh, the thing that to me uh, was uh, was kind of confounding. I'm not sure if it's it's something that I even anticipated in advance. It's not even something that I would have said I could have anticipated in advance and then pro been proven false. Uh, but it was simply um, uh, this ballot measure in Florida, where uh, where B Joe Biden won uh, won only 48% uh, of the votes in. Uh, in Florida this year, and yet 61% of voters uh, supported a ballot measure for a $15 minimum wage, which is, uh, you know, four years ago was considered a very far left um, policy that uh, Hillary Clinton was unwilling to support. Um, and so, understanding what it was, what it was that would motivate Floridians to to um, to split their tickets in that way, in some sense, is. Uh, fascinating. We see a similar dynamic in in Maine, where Susan Collins ran seven points ahead of Donald Trump. I think there's a lot of interesting stuff going on in the uh, in the among voters who are uh, splitting their tickets across um, across uh, different issues. Um, so I'd like to think more about that. Efren. Yeah. Uh, so I'll start it a little bit in reverse. And uh, one thing that I think um, we didn't anticipate perhaps that did go wrong was the polling story. And I just like to add, you know, it, it went wrong with a couple of new wrinkles, right? So uh, <laughs> there, there's a lot of sort of uncertainty and controversy about what exactly was happening with uh, non-white voters, right? And this is part of a larger struggle and challenge that I think pollsters have had in getting a good reading on the pulse of these many uh, diverse communities. So. Uh, sort of it came back to to bite us and haunt us in some way. Um, the thing that I, I at least for from where I sit uh, did pan out in the way that we anticipated at least after um, the new year started was that it wasn't going to be uh, so much an election around the economy and its merits but that it turned into an election about uh, inequality writ large right and this is sort of underlined by the pandemic and the various disparities um, that were highlighted by the disease itself and by how the candidates either highlighted them or try to run away from them. Um, but also if we recall like during the summer, um, we had a spat of uh, you know, police brutality cases that just got an enormous amount of airtime, further highlighting some of the disparities that existed uh, in the nation. And so as much as we, probably would have thought this would have been an, econ uh, an economy sort of centered uh, election. It was less so with um, a lot of the airtime being soaked up by uh, issues of, of inequality between various groups uh, in American society. I think, I think all of those points are gonna set us up for some, some fascinating uh, discussions and we'll come back to, to all of these um, sooner or later. Um, I guess one other kind of broad picture question I have, and then maybe we can dive into some of the, the details is, is it seems to me like the last 10 years have really revealed deep division in this country, uh, not only across the major parties, but, but within the parties themselves. And I'm curious what y'all's thoughts on, are on, on what impact this has had on, uh, the parties themselves, the coalitions uh, that that formed the to to support these candidates, and you know perhaps to what degree the way that people consume information might be exacerbating some of these divisions. I'll jump in and start um, just by saying that this is such a 
popular idea that social media in particular and the rise of cable news with a point of view might be driving, I'll say what's wrong with American politics at the minute, but uh, in the minute, but what I mean is like what people don't like about American politics in this minute. So I spend a lot of time thinking about this because I'm not, I'm not sure it's true. And um, I'm not sure it's true because we have known a couple of things for decades and decades and decades in American politics. And one of those things is that people always filter out information that is inconsistent with their predispositions. Um, so they're more likely to accept information and update their beliefs, all else equal, if that information is consistent with the prior views that they hold. So the change is now how easy it is to get information and how you can expose yourself to more information that is consistent with your priors. Um, and there might be interesting things to say on the margins there about the information that sneaks in that is inconsistent with your priors and might, might slowly over a long period of time lead you to a different position. But in terms of sort of wholesale change, I think it's hard to hang that on cable news and social media. Another thing we've known for a long time in American politics is about uh, partisan politics and the way that parties either bargain and compromise to get things done or um, contest each other. And one of the things I think that is more defining of the current moment is the fact that the parties are relatively homogenous within. So they're, they're um, it, it, if I say like this person's a Democrat, you know exactly what I mean. There's a homogeneity to being a Democrat more so than there's been in probably anybody's lifetime who is on this, um, on this call. And that is um, a factor. Also the, the closeness of elections, the, the hard fought candidates are well-financed, these campaigns are hard fought. So that instead of bargaining and compromising with the other side to get a little bit of what you want, you might just say, I'm gonna hold out two more years, three more years, and maybe my side's in power and I can get everything I want. And so I think that dynamic is adding more to um, what people don't like about politics than um, social media. I'd like to pick up a little bit on what, on what Lynn said, because I think it's important to um, sort of contrast um, what is available for public consumption as far as media narratives about how we want to understand American politics and then what we know sort of from a social science perspective and, and, and Lynn's point about, um, you know, being, a, I think, a little bit over generous with the interpretation that social media in particular is responsible um, kind of does a little bit of injustice to a, a variety of other plausible explanations that hold a lot more water, right? So one of the things that I would add here is really a lot of the divisiveness is really among elites, right? And even if we set aside political leaders uh, for, for the moment, you know, they do have incentives um, to heighten up those divisions. Um, the division is also among people who are much more aware and attentive to uh, politics, but there's an enormous sea of individuals in the mass public for whom uh, politics continues to be uh, an incredible sideshow, right? It's, it's a bit of a circus that they might tune in irregularly, sporadically in some ways. Right, and so this is consistent with a lot of what we know, for example, about um, whether media have uh, effects, right, on the mass public. And one of the, I think, more arresting findings is that, well, if it does, they're pretty minimal, right? They're pretty small. So if we want to say that the, uh, uh, media, social media in particular, had an effect um, this uh, election, I do think that it might have been a fluke in the following sense, right? We've been on general lockdown. For, for almost a year, which means that we had less distractions, less avenues for, uh, for information consumption, whether they were entertainment related or political. And so almost uh, by force, we were, we were asked to see politics on a much larger scale. And then maybe that's in part why people feel we're a lot more divided um, than we actually are. But uh, I would actually uh, lean a, a bit more on, 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 on Lynn's side of things and just say that uh, in some ways, um, if there is divisiveness, it, I don't think it's as widespread as uh, maybe news outlets would make us believe. And do y'all think that the, the coalition, I mean, 
putting aside the, the kind of perception of division, uh, do you think, or do we know yet, um, as the data comes in, if the actual, if the coalitions that, that supported the candidates changed uh, in this election relative to, to previous elections? I think going to your point, Efren, about um, the polls having missed uh, the, the levels of support for the candidates among non-white voters, Maybe it's a question of whether or not the polling's correct, but but is there can we tell yet if if there actually was any evidence that that it, individuals either switched their votes or that different uh, types of voters actually turned out? Yeah, so I mean, in terms of coalitions, right? These aren't things that were developed overnight. Uh, we're talking about very long run efforts uh, within each of the parties uh, to develop a base of support that they can turn out on a regular basis, election after election, and then add on and take away from the other side of the party. I think what was a slightly different um, um, uh, this time around is that just given the circumstances that were in play, right, that were really out of our control, pandemic, police shootings, et cetera, like that, um, I think you, you see on, on the Democratic side of things, um, their coalition coming into very sharp relief. So one way to view that electoral coalition in previous years is that, look, they have their work cut out for them, right? You're talking about a party that, yes, is left of center, but there's enormous heterogeneity, uh, heterogeneity around that central tendency. So Democrats have to do a lot of work to keep that coalition intact. I think that was less of a challenge uh, this time around because a lot of what they could draw on from the real world to mobilize their base was just a little bit more in line with the direction that they were already building. Um, on the other side of things, uh, I think the election also underlines some of the opportunities, some of them unanticipated for building in new directions, right? And so on the Republican uh, side of the ticket, right? If we're willing to believe, right? And I'll have a little bit more to say about this, but if we're willing to believe that the president and then Republicans more generally um, were able to make some inroads uh, into these non-traditional constituencies, let's say people of color, right? What it tells you is that, look, um, uh, race is not the only identity that is in play for all individuals for these communities. Um, and so one way to explain, for example, what you saw in uh, very heavily Mexican American counties in South Texas is, if you recall, I mean, the president was talking a lot about law and order. And while that might have repelled the grand majority of people of color, in many of those counties, who do you have living there? You have border patrol agents, sheriffs, people that are affiliated with law enforcement. And so for better or for worse, I think the messaging basically amplified an occupational identity relative to their racial identity. And this is how you sort of get, get the runner out at first that isn't paying attention, right? <laughs> Dan, if you want to jump in, otherwise, I, I, I would love to maybe keep going on that topic, uh, Efren, and, and given your, your research more broadly and, and what you, I assume you are like the rest of us, uh, consuming news quite frequently these days, um, uh, trying to get more, more data as it comes in, is how, we, how to think about this idea that, that people you know, have many identities at play um, that uh, and, and in particular, like how to think about people's racial and ethnic identities and their partisan identities and, and which, which ones might be more or less salient for voters as they cast their votes? Yeah, so I mean, that's a, that's a great question and it's a complicated question and it's actually part of what is exciting about being a political scientist in, uh, in this day and age. So, you know, one running intuition I would say is that, look, um, the, the battle between Republicans and Democrats really boils down to uh, a battle between uh, whites and non-whites. On the surface, I think that looks like it's the case, but it's a little bit more complicated than that. I think it gives the appearance that it turns out that way in part because people of color and whites on average are housed under different parties, right? And you know, all we have to do is pay attention to elections. What are we competing for and on what basis? The axis of competition is on parties. There's only two. You belong to the Republicans or you belong to the Democrats. So a lot of the efforts for our leaders is in threading together these various identities 
in a coherent and meaningful way. It doesn't have to be logical. It just has to make intuitive sense. And so one way to view this is, look, if you are a person of color in the United States, your racial or ethnic identity is nested under your democratic partisanship. That's the product of decades of work on the part of democratic uh, elites and leaders. And so the reason that race and occupation and gender and all these other identities that we associate with either of the parties come into play, uh, feel like they're salient is because really the efforts of coalition building have produced very well-worn grooves in people's minds as to where do my various social groupings belong if I can only choose between two parties, right? Um, and so I think that's part of uh, what, what you're seeing, but that convergence between different identities works on average in very neat patterns for some people, but not everyone, right? And so the example that I gave you about, let's say uh, a Mexican American voter works for the border patrol agent, lives in a border town, right? Um, their occupational identity in this election was probably a little bit in tension with their ethnic identity. And they resolved the conflict by basically going with what I imagine is a much more chronically available identity, which is their occupational one. Um, now, uh, one of the things that I think um, made this election work on the basis of identity, again, like uh, if you haven't read uh, Lynn's book on the message matters, read it, right? It's sort of a classic. And I think it's instructive in, in, in this particular election for a variety of ways, but one of them is, look, you get dealt the pandemic with a bunch of racial disparities, right? The vi I don't think the virus is racist, I mean, but, but this is how it manifested. You had a slew of police brutality cases being amplified by the media. And so what you saw was Democrats run with that messaging because it's consistent with the threading of these various groups and it paid off. They also made the decision to put Kamala Harris as a vice president. Typically that doesn't matter, but from a messaging standpoint, the thing that I would have paid, that I paid attention to was they never described her consistently as the first black woman or the first Asian woman. It was both. It was never a conversation about either. And that's to their credit. That was on purpose, right? That the whole point is, hey, look at everyone that belongs under the broad tent that is the Democratic uh, Party. Um, so, you know, one, one way to view uh, where we're going with these identity politics is that in some ways, both parties have an incentive to put together, thread together these various identity groups under the, a big umbrella that is their party, and then affirm as much as they can, you belong, you are central, you are respected, right? So anytime now you hear about the enormous contribution that, for example, Black women had in boosting Joe Biden's uh, prospects, all of that was, I mean, I wouldn't say 100%, but a big part of the story there is affirming that constituency's uh, efforts uh, and inclusion in, in the Democratic Party. So to this idea that the message matters, um, which I would agree with, Lynn, maybe you could speak to what what was what were the campaigns up to? What were the messages and the issues that they that they honed in on? What worked? Maybe what didn't? Yeah, it's um, it's my favorite thing to talk about. So thank you, Efren, for that <laughs> big pitch. Um, I I love this. Well, you know, no one loves twenty twenty, but one thing to love about twenty twenty is that it's this super unusual presidential election year where we start out the year with high growth in terms of the economy, Donald Trump going down to Florida to kick off his campaign in February. He, he can't stand that the Democrats are out there campaigning and he's not. So he's gonna kick his campaign off early in February, which is like a great thing because we get to observe what his strategy was going to be pre COVID. And he goes down to Florida and he says, you know, you don't like me very much. I get it, but you're gonna vote for me anyway because I brought you this booming economy. And I remember when I heard him say that, I thought to myself like, wow, like he gets it. He understands that it's his best play despite the songbook that he was singing from in 2016, which was all identity politics all the time. And he wasn't advantaged on the economy then. So it didn't make sense for him to talk about it. He, he got that in 2020, if he just talked about that, he was gonna be good. And then you get this 
unexpected shock to the whole system, COVID. And suddenly, almost overnight, the incumbent president finds himself not campaigning in a massive time of growth, but in a massive time of decline. And worse than that, people are dying on his watch. He is also sort of fighting a global war. So he's got COVID deaths and he's got declining economy. And then as Efren mentioned earlier, we get to Memorial Day and he's got the killing of George Floyd and the call for social justice around the globe. And he is an incumbent president in trouble. Um, And he recognizes that. And so then he shifts right away to back to identity politics and back to um, sort of the same, the greatest hits from 2016. But this time the identity inflection is not about the border wall or the Muslim ban. Uh, It's about those blue state governors and them, you know, wanting to take away your freedoms. And it's about Um, the black community and it's about the killing of George Floyd and these protesters who are coming to your neighborhood, you suburban women, and they're going to make you feel unsafe and they might move in in these housing, this housing that's available. And so he turned to that messaging. Now, Biden on the other hand gets it too. So this is a sort of a remarkable campaign where both sides understand where their advantage is potentially lie and they really stick to it. Unlike 2016, where the Clinton campaign got a little drawn into the Trump drama. Um, And I I say that they're culpable for their loss, but who wouldn't have? Who wouldn't have thought the easiest thing to do would be to say this guy, really? You know, why am I not 20 points ahead? So Biden learns from that lesson and he sticks to this election is a referendum on the performance of the incumbent president on COVID and on the economy. And he's not doing a good job. You are not better than you were for better off than you were four years ago. Kick this guy out. Um, and essentially that's the contestation that that 2020 is going to play out on. Um, and there was incredible message discipline from both sides. That Republican National Convention where you saw them, I think the McCloskeys is the name of the family that um, they're sitting in their living room and, you know, this could happen to you. What happened to us? You might have to protect your home. Donald Trump won't let this incredible message discipline um, from both sides. Um, And the election is super close as the economic situation would have uh, predicted. Uh, Trump overperforms his economy, um, but uh, he paid the price. Well, I I wanna give everybody a chance to, to, because I think that before before I ask about uh, kind of the mechanics of how, how these votes came to be, I think both of these topics open up some some interesting avenues of discussion. If 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 we have follow ups, so I don't have I, I I don't have a big follow up except to say that a lot of this was coinciding with baseball for me, and so <laughs> it, it gave new meaning the way uh, Lynn has just described to making adjustments right to <laughs> how, how reality is unfolding before you right, and I think. Um, you know, from, from, from a political science perspective, I think you saw a lot of the work done pre, by previous generations being validated in terms of the candidates going to and from in terms of what they were going to hammer home and why. The other thing, Aaron, that I should have said is about COVID changing the way people vote. So not just the discourse in the campaign, but the actual way that people cast ballots. Um, and so, you know, Dan knows more about this than, um, than I do. And so maybe I'll, I'll pitch it over to him to talk a little bit about what we know about people who tend to vote by mail and if you thought that that played out in this election. Sure, yeah. So, um, so yeah, as, as you said, there was, uh, and as we were discussing earlier uh, tonight, um, there was just an incredible level of engagement this year um, and one of the one of the natural and one of the you know obvious things that's been going was going on is that you know a lot of people already in January before COVID ever hit um, uh, there was a lot of uh, interest in this in this election and where we were headed, um, but in the in the spring we um, uh, we quickly came to realize that COVID wasn't going anywhere and uh, and already we were having to deal with a, holding a primary uh, that was essentially, you know, on its last legs um, during a pandemic. But we were looking forward to a fall where uh, it would be very difficult to um, 
to uh, hold an election in per fully in person the way that uh, we have in previous years. Um, and so it posed like an incredible challenge uh, to election administrators uh, to try to come up with a, a solution for this. Um, while also, uh, you know, also all of them were working, uh, you know, working, uh, many of them working remotely, just like, like many others. Um, and so it's, I think, a remarkable fact that uh, despite this, uh, this, uh, the challenges faced by, uh, by so many election administrators and by the public that we were able to achieve such a high level of uh, voter participation this year. And of course, that's not to say that there weren't challenges. Of course, there are many instances, uh, pe many people have pointed out of, uh, of, uh, of uh, cost, very costly um, uh, 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 barriers to voting in a number of places, very long lines and the like. Um, but by and large, uh, this resolved in an incredibly high turnout election. And some of the important patterns that come out of this, um, I think that you're that you're pointing to, Len. Uh, one of the things that's really interesting is, uh, you know, in in normal years, um, it hasn't been obvious, at least uh, as far as I understand, uh, that that one group of people are overwhelmingly using one mode of voting or another. Um, but ex for exactly the the reason that so many other uh, so many other behaviors have uh, become uh, uh, polarized uh, by party, we're also seeing uh, voting by mail become an incredibly uh, partisan uh, matter, where many many more Democrats voted by mail than did Republicans. Um, and what this uh, and this has this has uh, kind of two important uh, components that I think are important to kind of think through. The first is, uh, is, is whether this advantages one party over another. Um, and the, the existing work uh, suggests that, that uh, in normal times, uh, voting by mail doesn't seem to advantage one party over another. Um, and that uh, even in this year, uh, in what, li what little research we're able to have about this, um, it appears as though most of what's going on is that, uh, is that Democrats are uh, switching to vote by mail and Republicans are continuing to vote in person. Uh, but despite this, it doesn't. The, their in, their level of participation is uh, about what we would expect, um, uh, and so it doesn't appear as though uh, while voting by mail was uh, m much more taken up by Democrats, that Democrats were advantaged by the fact that they um, had access to these uh, policies. It's simply that they switched from voting in person to voting by mail, by and large. Um, but of course, this poses a separate challenge that's really important for us that we're contending with right now, which is that, uh, which is that voting by mail, because it's uh, so uh, heavily dominated by Democrats and voting in person was so dominated by Republicans, it makes it much easier to for parties to take advantage of these differences um, and to point out that point at one mode of voting and say it's not that I'm criticizing, uh, I'm not. It's not that I don't want to count Democrats' votes. It's that I want to not count votes by mail uh, or you know the opposite if if you would hear that and. And um, and so uh, accordingly, you know, while this is something that we haven't had to contend with in the past as much, where there were clear divisions in the method of voting and an easily uh, uh, in a way that we can easily kind of uh, uh, demonize particular sets of uh, um, voters by targeting uh, methods of voting. So it's a really interesting um, uh, set of problems that we've just run into um, this year and that I think we're going to continue to deal with over the over the coming few years as we see where uh, whether voting by mail main, is maintained at these high levels. Um, but also so I'm, it's I'm weirdly a, I just can I Dan can I just jump in to say like, it's weirdly another way that the parties became homogenous. Like it's just a it's you know it's just not helpful. We need some mixing. Yes yeah though I, I do think this I do think some of these some one. This is one thing that I wanted to wanted to um, chime in on on about this uh, about the homogenization of the parties. Is this there is some there is something really interesting that's going on in both of these cases that I was raising earlier around the Florida um, minimum wage uh, minimum wage. Uh, um, uh, uh, referendum, and the and this case of you know Susan Collins uh, way outperforming Trump and Maine, we do see while we while we see um, kind of uh, you know repeatedly um, 
uh, high levels of nationalization and and um, and kind of uh, parties ideologically uh, looking ideologically very similar within the party and very different from across, across parties, we see these glimmers of of really interesting um, uh, uh, cases where. Uh, where partisans seem to be um, moving across uh, across the lines, and so um, I think there is some something interesting to to continue to understand there. But I'm I, I mean one thing that I'm really interested in that we've talked about a little bit um, is uh, is the is the question of what happened with uh, with polling this year. And I know Aaron hasn't had hasn't chimed in quite yet. I'm. She, as many folks will know, she's an expert on uh, polling methodology, and um, I'm so especially interested to hear just her thoughts on what's happened this year um, uh, with respect to the polls and what we saw on um, last week. Thanks, Dan. Um, so I, I think it's a it's a great question, and I think it's one that that you know should be we, we should should we should know that it it is one that we will be able hopefully to answer with data at some point but most of that data has not come in so so i think it's hard to to know com completely but what i've been thinking about are the different ways that polling can go wrong so it strikes me that this election the polls were obviously wrong but they were wrong in what felt at least uh to me in a different way than in 2016. So in 2016, the national polls were actually some of the most accurate um, in, in the history of polling. Uh, the, um, the state polls were not so bad, except for uh, a few key states that turned out to be very important states. Um, but, you know, they, they uh, this time around, you know, we knew that, say, Georgia would be would be close or Arizona was pretty close this year and those both turned out to be true. There were some polling wins. Um, you know, I know one poll that uh, they polled voters in, in Pennsylvania and they, uh, who had already cast a vote b before election day and they predicted there'd be about an 80-17 split and it was like 80-19, right? So, so there are some places where uh, polling, you know, was pretty accurate and then a lot of places where it wasn't. Um, the uh, and and so I, I think that the the open questions to me one that I I am super curious to know as the data comes in is how so the there's you know you have to get people on the phone so we can come back to this idea of non response which I think is the was one of the stories that came out of out of 2016 that is still a important problem but the other big part of of a poll uh, a po political poll where you try and predict who's going to win is is predicting who's going to turn out. And to, to, this, to this idea that this was an exceptionally high turnout election, um, there, there was maybe evidence, especially through early voting, which was skewed more, more towards the Democrats that might lead you to believe that there's gonna be more enthusiasm among Democrats. You combine that with like enthusiasm in the midterms. Um, I'm curious to see if, if how much of it is, is kind of driven by, we just got the, the turnout electorate, the composition of the electorate wrong um, in our predictions and, and uh, more heavily favored uh, uh, Democratic uh, voters. Um, so, so I think that's going to be part of it. But, you know, I, I think that this idea that out of 2016, you know, we learned, okay, that that was part of it. But the, the big part was this idea of not accounting for education correctly, right, that there were these voters, these lower education voters that we weren't kind of giving enough weight to. Um, I think that's still going to be an issue, but, you know, pollsters were doing that this time. We were waiting on, well, we, I was not doing polls, but uh, they were waiting on education generally, and that wasn't enough to fix it. Um, so, so then, then it becomes an issue of, okay, well, it's not just education specific types of voters, right? It's, it's lower education, you know, in 2016, it was lower, like non-college educated voters uh, primarily white voters in the Midwest, right? And so how do we think about all of these, these kind of um, different things we could account for? And so maybe some of it will be that we haven't figured out kind of the intersection of all of these um, uh, identities and, and parts of our, of our uh, demographics that, that we need to account for. Um, but, 
but what I, you know, so I think those are going to be the two pieces and I think they're going to matter in different places. And then I think to uh, the other piece was is that we need to get better um, going back to what Efren started us off with at, at surveying um, not non-white voters, uh, which is, is a, it, it's both important because, um, you know, especially say for Latino voters, the, the divide is not, you know, it's 60, 40, I think uh, you were saying Efren kind of typically is not, you know, not super polarized. You need more, more respondents to have a better sense of where uh, that uh, those voters are, um, and we aren't we aren't getting enough uh, non-white voters because they're hard to reach, and we probably need even more of them in our survey in order to just get a good measurement. And so I think I think that that's going to be the third part that that going forward we're going to have to to figure out how to how to survey non-white voters in, in a you know better way given both the the lower response rates and the kind of division within the the group. Hey, Erin, um, can I, I ask have a question? Yes. <laughs> um, I, I want to ask if you think this could be true. So yes. um, with our colleague, Chris Tosanovich, we've been, Chris and I have been in the field every week for since July of 2019 with asking 6,000 people questions. Um, and guess how many Republicans, so this is for everybody to play at home, guess how many Republicans agreed to answer our survey after the, after the election, we go into the field on Thursday. So in the Thursday after the election, okay, the answer is many, many, many fewer than had agreed to take our survey at like any point in time prior to that. And so I'm wondering if you think that it could be true that when people think that their candidate is losing, they are less likely to talk to pollsters. Um, and so like that would explain our drop in Republican, like, and, and if people thought that Biden was ahead by eight points, like they're just less likely to talk to pollsters. I think it's possible, although one piece of evidence that I have heard of, and, and I'd be curious within your, your data, so I, I believe you were in the field before the pandemic started, right? So um, the, yes. the, that, that, that is possible. So, so the, the kind of other place that you see this is say like in response to the, um, to a debate, like a lot of times you'll see like, you know, the debate happens or not the debate, sorry, the, the convention happens. And then, you know, the, the parties whose convention just happened, those voters are kind of riled up and they, they respond at a little bit higher rates. Um, it's possible for sure. But I have heard that within, this is something where internet panels are really useful is that we ask people their partisanship at the beginning, right? So there's another story out there that the Democrats were at home you know, and, and bored and therefore answering at higher rates um, because everybody's home from the pandemic. But, but what I have heard and, and, and what we would want to look at in your data is if you ask people their partisanship beforehand, you should know, right? And so I would believe that right after the election, that's true, but during the, the cycle, did you see, you know, big, big shifts in, in those response rates? And, and yes, there's going to be a baseline difference, but are those were those differences really changing? And 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 my understanding is that a lot of times when you have that panel data, it's really hard to actually find specific non-response on that uh, partisan non-response to explain the differences that we see. But hopefully, you'll share your data. Yeah. Oh yes, happy to share. <laughs> I have a, it's not it's not a panel though so that's a limitation. Oh, okay. I, I have a question for Lynn that just uh, has been I've been thinking trying to understand a little bit better and I've been hearing a lot of people talk about it and I'd just be curious to hear hear your thoughts on it Lynn is about the um is about how we should think about characterizing the the economy this year. There have been so many there have been so many different uh, explanations of what what the economy looked like and how people were understanding it. Um, and we talked. You talked about this a little bit before, but I'd just like to hear hear you uh, uh, on this particular question of like, what is it that what is it we've we've I've heard a lot that voters are that voters are actually pretty uh, or a lot of citizens are um, pretty positive on the on the state of the economy even now. And I'm I'm just curious how you how you think about what that means. Yeah. Or if you so, believe it. Um, <laughs> two two things to think about. The first is we want to definitely think of these things as different 
what people think of the economy and what the economy is actually doing. So those are different things. The reason we have to think about them differently is that people's evaluations of the economy get all clouded up by their party identification. So going back to the thing I started with about people filtering out information that's inconsistent with their predispositions, Republicans think the economy is doing better because there's a Republican in the White House than Democrats do. And man, once that Democratic control switches to the White House, Democrats are gonna think the economy is doing better. It happens every single time. So, so we wanna be talking about the real economic performance. And you're exactly right, Dan, it's super weird. And I can tell you how I'm thinking about it, but I can't tell you how voters are thinking about it because it's just not clear yet. Um, there hasn't been enough time to really hammer away at this. But what's weird about this is that if you look at the first six months of the election year, January to June, and you take GDP change, it's a negative number. It's going to be about negative three or something. That's about like 1980. Okay. That doesn't work out well for incumbent presidents. Trump will overperform Jimmy Carter, but that's about the same growth rate we're talking about. It's the worst. And since the New Deal, it's the worst number ever. Okay. But if you look at changes in real disposable income, so per people's personal finances, not the nation's economy, but your personal economy in the first six months of the election year, it is the highest, the most positive number we have ever had. Why? Because of the stimulus. Okay, now Trump should have been able to claim credit for that. He signed those checks. He sent the letters. He put his name on them. Like he sort of, again, he got it that he could deliver to you the ability to buy things and maybe, you know, a new car, a new refrigerator, whatever it is you've been saving money for. A lot of people, their incomes went up significantly because of that stimulus program. So we have these two competing economies. And I don't, I don't know how voters make sense of that. Um, in my work, I've always looked at the nation's economy. And so that's sort of what I privilege when I think about how voters evaluate the national conditions. And if you look at the outcome of this election, they kicked the guy out. So the nation's economy seems to be a little privileged there in people's minds, because if you look at income growth, um, it is really good in those first six months. Okay, so we have covered where, uh, kind of what, what, what voters, uh, like how they're processing information, how they're processing their identities, how their the campaigns are pitching to them, how, how we're measuring all of this, and how it was actually uh, evaluated and, and counted and tallied and, and everything. Looking forward, um, you know, uh, We'll have, you know, we'll have a, a, a democratic administration, a very, very closely divided, but but narrowly democratic uh, house, and then as yet to be determined uh, Senate. How how or can um, Biden govern, and what it, what what do you think it's going to look like, and and you know how is all of this uh, all of the, all the stuff we've been talking going to play into that. I think he leans in on experience. Like, I just think the guy's, you know, he's no, he knows all these people. Um, and hopefully that's worth something. I don't know. Yeah, that's I mean, all I got. I, yeah, well, I, I, <laughs> to add to that. So yeah, I mean, I, I think it is the experience. I think with the experience comes the ability to basically prioritize what is most likely to um, go through, right? Uh, at least legislatively, um, and what is sort of a little bit more chimerical things that, that you maybe can dangle in front of people. Um, and this is, this is actually, uh, I think, a, a struggle that, that any administration would have coming in, especially given the makeup of their coalitions, right? You, you, you can promise them the world during the election, but out of that world, you can only select a few things. Um, you know, for what it's worth, I mean, I think in, in my heart of hearts, I think Biden has in his eye the sort of how do we dampen down the consequences of the pandemic, right? And that's, I think, the thing that, that he could probably deliver most likely on. 
And then things, you know, that, that are sort of prized possessions or, or pri prizes that the Democrats dangle before their constituents, I think they're gonna have to make some really tough choices and come up with some creative arguments as to why they can't uh, deliver. Political science would tell us it should be a fairly moderate agenda, no? Do you, do you think that that will, I mean, it sounds like you think that will be the case, but um, do you think that that will have implications and in, in say the 2022, should we make it there? Um, uh, elections, I think, you know, a, a question for me would be uh, this idea of, of, of more kind of extreme for each party challenges to, to a Congress that does govern somewhat moderately? I, I think there are real opportunities to make progress on things that most Americans want. Um, it, you have to be a political entrepreneur to do this. And this is why I think Biden's experience is important. Um, personal relationships with some of these Republican senators might be just enough to say like, look what's in this for you. Everybody, I mean, not everybody, I'm exaggerating. Many, many, many people in the country want things like universal gun background checks um, and want things like a dreamer path to citizenship. And this is win, 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 any way you slice it. Um, so, you know, majorities of Republicans want these things, or majorities of Democrats want these things, and independents who pay less attention generally. So, there are opportunities here to you know, advance some things. It's just the priorities are different within the parties about these things. Um, but nonetheless, Republicans constituents want these things and Democrats too. And so there's opportunity here to craft something that, that can be good. Um, Efren earlier mentioned their politicians incentives can be incentive compatible for them to deliver some things that voters actually want. Um, and I don't know, maybe I'm naive, but I'm a little hopeful. I, I don't am I think, crazy, Dan? No. <laughs> Efren, am I crazy? <laughs> no, I, I, I don't think so. So in some ways, actually, the, the way I hear uh, Lynn's sort of take on this is that really the, 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 the moneymaker here is in convincing uh, people at the elite level, right? Because I do think that both parties have information. I mean, we've seen several articles come out about how there is so much agreement at the mass level on big ticket items, right? But a lot of the resistance is uh, sort of with the power brokers. And so I do think, you know, consistent with what Lynn just said, that to the extent that Biden has that experience, that track record, those personal relationships, I'm not saying he's going to be successful at everything he proposes, but he can pick and choose, think, you know, a, a handful of things that he can deliver on that says, hey, uh, we, we were effective this, this time around. The only thing I would add is I, I, I do think and I'm hopeful that that's something as simple as the pandemic, right? Um, it seems like a big ticket item that people want some resolution on. Um, but to Lynn's point, how we resolve it, I do think that there's sort of some, some disagreements there even at the, the mass level, right? Yeah, agreed. I mean, I think I think the reality is that on all of these things, we're going to be uh, uh, we're going to be finding out in the next uh, in the next few weeks, even uh, what this is going to look like as we try to man manage through this transition. Um, uh, simply because we're already, I mean, we're already seeing. It's not like the dynamics are going to be dramatically different, assuming that the. Um, that uh, the Republicans can keep at least one of these two Senate seats in Georgia. Um, it's not like the, uh, the the kind of dynamics are going to be dramatically different, other than like Lynn is saying, the uh, uh, what Biden is willing to, what his 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 unique ability uh, as a as a leader, if he has any unique abilities, um, those will have to be uh, what drives any compromise. Um, uh, and uh, but it's it's uh, it's very I think it's I think it's really hard to settle on a particular path um, uh, forward without seeing some examples. Can I ask a question of all of you guys? Do, does anyone think that the um, the sort of unofficial um, turning over of the keys, the transition that that Trump is holding the, the transition money and everything back? Do any of you think that that is a serious and significant impediment to Biden's ability to, to get moving on things? Uh, not really. <laughs> so I do think that I don't a, a, a lot of this is, 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 is political theater, probably on both sides to some extent, right? You indulge 
the, the, the craziness as it's called on one side um, and, and lean into it. Uh, but, you know, I mean, Biden himself, the folks that have already come to light that he's picked as part of his transition team and administration, I mean, it's not their first rodeo, right? Um, and so uh, could we have sort of like a, you know, a, a shadow administration and a shadow <laughs> new administration? Maybe, but I think officially speaking, uh, we know that when it's nine innings, it's nine innings, right? Um, I'm, I'm the, the manager on the other side could go kicking and screaming into the dugout, and that's probably what's going to happen. But <laughs> the, game, the game is over, right? I mean, that's that's I think how 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 it how it runs. I mean, I think uh, th that that was sort of one thing that w w we didn't touch on. That I'm wondering if, if if all of you actually have something to say about. Um, the, the sort of side conversation that has been looming in the past few weeks, especially about, um, you know, erosion of democratic principles and norms. And, you know, now the U.S. is just like any other um, sort of second or third world country on, on, on those dimensions. And, you know, I, I, I don't know. I don't know if I want to interpret this as, as affirmation that we have, you know, pretty strong procedural norms, or if I want to say it as a uh, uh, you know, an exception to, to an otherwise quite dominant pattern, right, in American politics. Efren picked up on my, my last uh, question, <laughs> oh, which was going to be about, about norms and, and kind of thinking, you know, post-pandemic, and we have two minutes left, so just kind of like, what, what has permanently changed and what, what might, you know, what, what might get back to, to what, what was seemingly normal and, and you know, since you opened it up, Efra and I will give my my two cents, which is I think that your your point about the division of, of the elites is is one that really resonates with me. Is is I don't know yet if the political norms will return, but I think that a lot will be, you know, once we get through the pandemic and we see, you know, which is like Lynn said, something we can all uh, kind of agree on trying to 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 is good for everybody, right? And it should be something that that can be um, pushed through what you know what how do the elites respond so that's where i will be looking to see if if the norms uh stand a chance of returning i think the institutions are strong i'm i'm with efren and i yep. did a history podcast then and now last night with Lori frazier our colleague and she and i were in agreement that democracy is 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 not dying and um the norms are strong and particularly the one you just saw the norms of a free and fair scheduled regularly scheduled election yeah, I'll second that. I think that's. Uh, I think that that that. Uh, I think the the real challenge is is in uh, in figuring out the right way to communicate to to a relatively small number of people who uh, who um, are especially uh, um, concerned about the how we've we're running our elections. Um, and uh, and so I think you know it's it's uh, it's a challenge that elites are having to figure out how to manage. But um, but uh, but by and large, I think these uh, um, uh, I think these norms are going to hold. Well, that's a, a a great note to end on. Um, thank you so much, everybody, and and I hope that this has been uh, a, as wonderful of an experience for everybody watching as it has been for us to get to chat. And thank you, Aaron. Thank you. Aaron. Yeah. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks. It's good to see everybody. Yeah, it was good to see you. Go Bruins. Yeah. <laughs>